In this lecture, we will discuss the effect of electric and magnetic fields on the optical absorption in semiconductors. At the beginning, we'll talk about the effect of electric fields, which includes the Franz Keldish effect. And later, we'll discuss the Stark effect. As far as magnetic fields are concerned, we'll uh, discuss Landau splitting and the Zeeman effect. Now, you may ask uh, why these effects are considered important. Although in bulk semiconductors, as we'll see, the effects are rather small, but in quantum wells or quantum confined structures, these effects are rather large, and there are applications in as optical modulators and switches. So at the beginning, we'll study the Franz Keldish and the Stark effects in bulk semiconductors. And later on, uh, we'll try and see what these effects are in uh, quantum confined structures. Now, as you know, the Franz Keldish effect is concerned with the effect of strong electric fields of the order of 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 5 volts per centimeter on the band edge of semiconductors. Typically, we'll consider gallium arsenide. Now, as you know, when you have an electric field applied, the conduction and valence bands are inclined so that the inclination is in the direction opposite to that of the electric field because the energy levels here correspond to electron energies, whereas the electric field gives the uh, field from positive to negative. Now, if the band gap is EG, um, what we want to s examine is what happens when the photon energy, H nu, is slightly less than the band gap EG. Now, without any electric field, we know that the optical absorption here will be very small. If the field is large enough, then if we consider the energy H cross omega, and we are examining the crossing of electrons, the excitation of electrons from the valence band to the conduction band in the presence of a field, then we know that the both the electron wave functions in the conduction band and in the valence band, they are exponentially decaying as you enter the band gap. And here also in the conduction band, the electron wave function decays when uh, you get into the uh, band gap. So at the classical turning points, A and B, uh, these are positions in, this is in space, uh, 
the wave function uh, change from oscillating to decaying and the wave functions are given by u k e to the power j k x where k is imaginary. So, this term is e to the power minus alpha x which is decaying. With the increase of electric field, E, what happens is that the distance between these turning points A and B without an electric field would be something very large D. This decreases if this is E g minus h cross, cross omega and this is E g. Electric field is in the same direction. Um, with increase of electric field, the distance AB decreases. Therefore, there is increasing overlap of the electron wave functions uh, in the conduction band and valence band. And we can see that if optical absorption corresponds to excitation of an electron from the valence band into the conduction band, it is akin to excitation of an electron from A to this point and then it must tunnel through this triangular barrier into the conduction band. So it is also a case of photon assisted tunneling. The electron is being excited by the photon from A to the point here which is not enough to get into the uh, conduction band but uh, the barrier here is small enough for the photon in the presence of a high electric field to tunnel and uh, get to B uh, in the conduction band. So, uh, for a band gap for E G and width of D, which uh, is the distance required for tunneling, then D must be equal to E G by Q E, where E is the electric field applied. With electric, f with assistance of, of a photon, having h cross omega less than e g, the tunneling distance becomes d dashed. The tunneling distance without any photon is this, with an electric field applied is, is this distance d. Uh, with a photon uh, incident and exciting the electron, this distance becomes much smaller d dashed and as a result d dashed is equal to 
E G minus H cross omega by Q E. Now, without going into the detailed mathematics, uh, obviously, if this is much less, then uh, you know that uh, using uh, the WKB type of uh, approximation, when you are tunneling through a, uh, a triangular barrier, if the barrier height becomes less, the tunneling probability increases considerably. So, uh, the net result is that the overlap of the wave functions increase and uh, the electrons in the valence band can tunnel into the conduction band. So, we have, we can apply the WKB uh, approximation for tunneling through a triangular barrier. And thereby, alpha is calculated to be equal to k e dashed to the power half, 8 beta to the power minus 1. And obviously, there will be a tunneling term, the exponential term given by exponential minus 4 by 3 beta to the power 3 by 2. where beta is obviously uh, equal to this e g minus h cross omega by um, e dashed. e dashed is proportional to uh, the applied electric field. e dashed is equal to q squared e squared, h squared by twice reduced mass mr star to the power half. And k is a material dependent parameter. Which is 5 10 to the power 4 centimeter inverse e v to the power minus half for Gallimard's time. So, if you look at these terms, um, you find that uh, this exponential term is just the probability of tunneling through a, a triangular barrier of uh, width d dashed. Um, and the other terms are dependent upon the material properties. Obviously, the band gap uh, comes in. Now, if we take the example of Gallimard's night, um, we've already found the coefficient k. So, if we plug that in, then we find that if h cross omega minus e g is equal to 20 MeV, that means alpha is small, 4 centimeter inverse for E is equal to 10 to the power 4 volts per centimeter. So, in bulk materials, we find that the increase with electric fields of this order is rather small. So, Fk effect is rather small for E less than 10 to the power 5 volts per centimeter. Remember, uh, near the bulk absorption edge, alpha uh, rises for a direct cap semiconductor, rises very large, very rapidly to 10 to the power uh, 3 or 10 to the power 4 uh, per centimeter inverse. Right. Um, 
so for example, if you have a um, bulk sample of thickness, um, say 10 microns, in order to get any appreciable effects, you will require a voltage of the order of 100 volts, which is quite large. However, the importance of this Franz Keldish effect, uh, as I'll show later, is for um, in quantum wells where the thickness of the well could be 100 angstrom and then the voltage applied uh, is then can be of the order of um, one volt. But in bulk materials, what is the manifestation of uh, the Franz Keldish effect? The experiments were done around 1962 after the predictions of the Franz Keldish effect were made in 1959 by Professor Franz in uh, Germany and Professor Keldish at the same time in uh, the US. Uh, sorry, in uh, USSR. Uh, and what was found experimentally was that near the band edge of Gallimard's night, without an electric field, one got an edge, something like that. And with an applied electric field of ten kilovolts per centimeter, thirty kilovolts per centimeter. So effectively what happens is that uh, there's a downward shift in the absorption edge. Or you can say that there's a broadening of the absorption edge. For example, here where Without any electric field, the absorption is very small. Uh, this is 2 log alpha, and here log alpha is, is 8. Uh, with an electric field, the absorption increases quite rapidly. So if you have, uh, for example, a laser which is going through Gallimard's night, and the laser wavelength is here, if there is no electric field, the laser will get through. If the electric field is applied, then the absorption goes up, right? And uh, so one could think of a device like this where you have applied electric field and a laser light incident and you have a detector if v is equal to zero transmission is high if v is uh, large um, say then transmission is low because the absorption increases. And so this is acting like a switch. We'll see that this is a practical device when we use uh, quantum wells, um, either single or multi multiple, so that uh, the applied voltage required is, is much smaller. 
So this is the Franz Keldysh effect, uh, which has become of importance in uh, optical modulation of uh, communication systems. Now let's come to the Stark effect, which is a classical effect discovered in optics um, in the splitting of uh, spectroscopic lines. We can very simply uh, consider um, an elect elliptical electron orbit where the center of gravity and the focus is separated by a distance d due to an electric field E. So the electric field tends to align elliptical orbits uh, in its direction. And so obviously with considering elliptical orbits, there is no, if, no effects on S states, spherically symmetrical S states in, um, in an atom, but the P states in the, um, in the conduction band, excited states uh, corresponding to elongated orbits um, are affected. And Due to the application of the electric field, there is a shift in energy of, say, of P states in the conduction band, uh, which is equal to delta E Q D uh, into electric field. So, uh, this results in splitting of the outer 2s and 2p states. Uh, And there will be uh, um, in the first order, there will be an energy shift proportional to E, the first order Stark effect. And the second order Stark effect. energy shift is proportional to E squared because as we've, as we've seen in this case, uh, the turning on the, of the E field induces a dipole which interacts with the uh, electric field and causes a shift in the energy uh, proportional to the electric field or the squared term. So we have a stark splitting of the band levels and we find that uh, In the case of Gallimard's night, we have without an electric field, we have an optical absorption coefficient of this type, and with the application of an electric field, we have
oscillations of this type. Uh, one can think of this conduction band edge being split due to the electric field and as a result transitions from here to here uh, show oscillations because it, it may be the transition may be a maximum and then it will go through a minimum and then it will show a secondary maximum, ter tertiary maximum, etc. Uh, and so we get at low temperatures one can uh, get distinct lines corresponding to these corresponding to these peaks. Again, uh, the Stark effect becomes important in uh, single quantum well and uh, multi quantum well devices, as I'll show, uh, where the exciton binding energies are, uh, are large. In fact, we have a device called uh, quantum confined. which acts as QCSE, which acts as, as modulators. Let me uh, go into the effect of magnetic fields now. Turning on the magnetic field causes Landau splitting of the energy levels. Uh, and as you know, when you have a magnetic field applied in the z direction, nothing happens to the electron motion along the z direction, but the electron motion along the x and y directions are affected. The energies are changed. And uh, along the x and y directions, we have uh, by writing out the equations of motion uh, in the presence of electric and magnetic fields, one can show that there is a rotation with angular frequency omega c, which is the cyclotron resonance frequency. which is given by QB by M star. Uh, this is very important uh, for another reason. It is useful for d direct determination of the effective mass. If you can, uh, if you know the applied magnetic field, if you can measure the cyclotron resonant frequency, this gives you a direct determination of the effective mass of electrons or, or holes. In fact, uh, since these effective masses are direction dependent, one can do this experiment as a function of the crystal orientation and find out how M star varies. Uh, typically, uh, for magnetic fields of the order of a few thousand Gauss, uh, omega C's are in the microwave region. So, one has to do this experiment in the microwave cavity at low temperature because uh, the rotation period must be um, comparable with or smaller than the uh, collision time, the relaxation time. So at room temperature, the relaxation is, time is rather small. So if you cool down the relaxation time between collisions, uh, the atoms, uh, the electrons are um, rotating in circular orbits, but if the electrons must not be scattered. The scattering time is of the order of tau. Okay, so uh, tau must be greater than uh, one by uh, omega c. Right? That's why this experiment has to be done at low temperature. Okay, uh, now in the presence of magnetic fields, the energies are quantized and E x y is equal to Q h cross b over m star. 
to n plus half, where n are integers. Whereas the energies in the z direction are unaffected because it's in the direction of the magnetic field, h squared k squared by twice m star. So this distorts the distribution of energy, the energy states then which were of this type going as e to the power half This is proportional to energy in the absence of the magnetic field. In the, abs in the presence of magnetic field, this is split up into discrete levels. And first, we notice that the minimum is raised. This is a value half above the ground level zero. And you have discrete lines. So these values are discrete, 3 by 2, 5 by 2, 7 by 2. So the effective magnetic field is that B raises the bottom of the conduction band by half Q H cross B by M E star. And the top of valence band is lowered by half Q H cross B by M H star, where H star is the, M H star is the effective mass of holes. So the net shift of energy gap delta E is half M E 1 by M e star 1 plus M h star Q h cross B uh, yes by Q h cross B right in CGS units you have there's a factor C that comes in um, in the denominator here so the expression for the density of states which I've just drawn becomes dn dE twice m star by h cross squared 1 by 2 pi L squared into E minus N plus half plus minus mu by 2 H cross omega C to the power minus half, where L is the radius of lowest cyclotron orbit. given by 1 by L squared is equal to M cross omega C by H cross and nu is M star G by twice M where for the first time we are seeing G which is the 
gyromagnetic ratio. Values of G are uh, well known in semiconductors and you see that the this dependence e to the power minus uh, something in h cross to the power minus half, it is this that gives this particular shape to uh, the density of states. And we will find that uh, later on in quantum confined structures, uh, in quantum wires and one dimensional um, quantum confined structures, we will find also the density of states is, is somewhat similar. This is uh, similar to quantum confinement by a uh, magnetic field and uh, if, if I give you for typical semiconductors in which Zeeman splittings are quite large, the indium arsenide, indium, arsen indium antimonide, indium arsenide and gallium arsenide, m by m star. Notice usually we write m star by m but this is the inverse m by m star is because the effective mass in indium and terminide is small, this is large 66, 36, 22 and G values are also very large minus 44, um, minus 12, minus gallium arsenide is much smaller okay. and so the values of nu which is G m star by twice m and the splitting is proportional to uh, nu. These are much larger in indium and terminide. This is 0 0.33, 0 0.17, and point, whereas gallium arsenide, it's one order of magnitude less, 0 0.013. Uh, this is due to the fact that uh, the effective masses in indium and terminide and indium arsenide are much smaller, okay, so they can respond. Uh, much more strongly with to the applied magnetic field and uh, the G values are accordingly uh, uh, much higher. Uh, let me come to the Zeeman effect. It's the interaction of B with orbiting electrons with results in uh, splitting of the original level at low fields delta E is equal to plus minus Q B H cross over twice m star and this is equal to half the Landau splitting. At high fields, this delta E is proportional to, at low fields it's proportional to B and at high fields it's proportional to uh, B squared. Uh, this nonlinear behavior occurs when the field is larger than the internal field, internal magnetic field due to spin and uh, orbital motion. Experimentally for gallium arsenide, delta E has been measured in the case of the quadratic effect at 4.2 K. Uh, we get a linear relation between delta E and B squared and this is due to the splitting of the energy levels of hydrogenic donors in gallium arsenide. 
So this just completes the discussion of the effect of electric and magnetic fields on bulk semiconductors. Electric field, we have the Franz Keldysh effect and the Stark effect. And for the application of magnetic fields, we have uh, the Landau splitting and the Zeeman effect. In the next lecture, we'll come to a discussion of what these effects are on quantum confined structures.